If you go to any Jewish home on a Friday night, you'll note that before the husband and for the man of the house makes Kiddush, the chalas are always covered. And you may wonder why is it that there is a halacha specifically that the chalas should be covered. And the tour brings two reasons. One of the reasons is because the mun in the midbar, when we were in the desert, we ate mun. The mun was covered on the bottom and the top with a certain covering. But probably the more primary reason is, as the tour brings the halacha, we cover up the bread so that it shouldn't be embarrassed. After all, in terms of the order of the brachas, first you should make a motzi, a gofen, the bracha and the wine comes secondarily. First you make the motzi and normally make the gofen after. But because Kiddush has its own mitzvah, its own importance, we're going to make the bar gofen first. The chalas might be embarrassed because after all, normally they go first. Here they're going second. In order to stop them from being embarrassed, we cover them so that they shouldn't um, see the Kiddush being made. Okay, very nice. Now, I'd like to ask what I consider the obvious question on that tour, which we all put into practice and we're all aware of. And that question is that the moon isn't made of green cheese. Howling winds don't menace. When you attribute non-human characteristics to non-human things, you're right. When you attribute human characteristics to non-human things, it's allegorical, it's maybe a metaphor, but the challah doesn't feel embarrassment. The challah is an inanimate object. It sits there on a table, it's made out of wheat, and it doesn't know whether you're supposed to make the bracha first on the wine or second on it. It doesn't care, it doesn't have emotions, it's not a live thinking entity. Why then do we all cover the challah to make sure it doesn't get embarrassed when clearly the challah does not sense any embarrassment, doesn't feel it? Why do we do it? Why is that the reason for the halacha? And what in fact are we supposed to learn from this? And I actually believe that there is a tremendous lesson to learn from this. And to understand that lesson, we need to focus a little bit more deeply on why Hashem gave us the Torah and what the focus of every mitzvah is, and specifically their arrangements. So let's begin with one observation. Every mitzvah in the Torah was given to us for one particular purpose, to perfect us, to allow us to reach higher levels, to allow the human being to reach the great heights that a human being can reach. The Torah is actually the system of human self-perfection. That being said, here's an interesting question. There are many, many, many mitzvahs, 613 of them. But if you realize that so many of them focus on one or two or three themes, you may say to yourself, why in the world do we need so many mitzvahs? For instance, you see it's Mitzrayim. Remembering the fact that Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim obviously is the center tenant of our religious system, underscores the fact that Hashem created the world and maintained it to this day. I get it. It's very important. It's central to everything we do. But why do we need 19 different mitzvahs to remember that fact? Each day in Shema, twice a day, we say the fact that Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim. We daven three times a day, we mention it. We wear tefillin every day to remind us of Mitzrayim. Sitzitz has an element of it also. On every mezuzah is a doorpost. The Sefer Chinuch counts 19 separate mitzvahs, all reminding us, about the fact that Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim. Once a day, twice a day should be sufficient. A few mitzvahs, two mitzvahs, four mitzvahs. Why do we need 19 mitzvahs to remind us of that fact? And the Sefer Chinuch asks this question, and the Sefer Chinuch explains a basic concept. And to explain that basic concept, I'd like to share with you an interesting observation. My father grew up in Germany, and he got to watch the Nazi party take power. But you have to appreciate the fact that he was already a teenager and he was already aware of what was going on. And I remember him saying to me once that he had the question that for years he didn't understand the answer to. Joseph Goebbels was an important minister in Hitler's entourage. Joseph Goebbels was a loyal follower. And when Hitler came to power, he gave Joseph Goebbels a very insignificant minor position 
And my father said it sounded like it was, it was an insult. He gave him minister of propaganda. Now, what is that? And why would you take an important, significant, trusted ally and give him such a minor, insignificant position? But the answer came out years later when people realized the wisdom of that appointment. You see, you have to recognize the fact that while the Nazis were extremely ideological and extremely bent on destroying Jews, in, implanting their worldview on the existence of mankind, they were a minority. When in 1933, when Hitler was elected Reich Chancellor, they had maybe 1.6 million Nazi members. The party was minuscule, it was tiny. At their, in 1936, after years later, they had maybe were 7% of the population. And even when it was obligatory to be a member of the Nazi party, to hold a university position, to hold a civil position, they had at most maybe 10%, maybe 12% of the population were actually members of the Nazi party. Because the reality is that while the Nazis were extraordinarily evil, they were but a minority of the German population. And again, my father explained to me that the average German shopkeeper, the average German clerk was not anti-Semitic. My father grew up in a German school system. And in 36, when things became very clear that Jews weren't welcome and the Nuremberg laws were put into place, my father went to the principal and explained that he's going now to a Jewish school. And the principal of the school said, why? Why don't you stay? My father said, I'm Jewish. That's no reason. You don't have to leave. And again, it seems that the average German was not anti-Semitic, and certainly the average German was not interested in Hitler's belief system. And that's exactly why he appointed Joseph Goebbels, because the minister of propaganda became one of the most influential positions in the Third Reich, because everything that the state could do, they did to educate. That means the papers, the airwaves, and there was a constant bombardment. What the Nazis realized was that a lie, a big lie, told often enough will be believed. And in fact, that's Hitler's line. Tell a lie big enough and often enough and people will believe it. And that's what the Nazi party did again and again, over and over. And if you'd like to know whether it succeeded or not, just read about the Nazi youth movement. Because by 38, already the lies had been propagated throughout the culture the youth who were buying into it in a very big way. And the Sefer Chinuch explains that's exactly why we have so many mitzvahs. Because the human being is largely influenced by what we hear, what we think about, and more than anything, by what we do. We're given many, many mitzvahs. Why? Because by the repetition of it, by doing it again and again, it changes the essence of me. But the Sefer Chinuch doesn't stop there. He goes even one step further. He says, whatever you do on a regular basis will become you. He says, for instance, let's assume you're an ethical, honest person. And you're given a job. Imagine you're in a kingdom. The monarch appoints you to a job that involves lying, stealing, and cheating. Now, you don't want to do it. You don't have a choice because if you don't, the king will off with your head. And you do dutifully your job against your will, against your interest, but you do it day after day after day. He says, I guarantee you will turn to be a deceitful, lying person. Because if all day long you're lying, even though you don't want to, even though you're not interested in it, it will affect you, it will change you. And he says it's very important to choose wisely your career path because what you do on a daily basis, what you do with your nine to five will greatly affect you. And this safe recognition is important to keep in mind because there are many professions that involve things that might be questionable and you have to be very discreet, and very careful what you choose because even if you don't want to, but if you take a job in a sales position that demands that you falsify, that you shade the truth, do it enough, long enough, it will change the essence of you. And while the goal over here is not career counseling, I believe what the Sefer Chinuch is teaching us is a fundamental principle. And that fundamental principle is that when we do things, and especially when we do them again and again and again, 
they become not just things that I do, they become the way I feel, the way I think, they become the essence of me, and it changes me in such a dramatic way. We have so many mitzvahs surrounding, circling around the fact that Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim. Why? Because it is such a central tenet to our belief system. We need constant chizik, constant reinforcement, and that's why there's so many mitzvahs surrounding it. And this reality that the human being is dramatically impacted, dramatically affected by what he does, is a principle that I believe you'll find over and over in life. And because the Torah is a system of self-perfection, obviously you'll see it repeated many times. And I believe that's exactly pshat in the Torah. When the Torah says we cover the challah because we don't want to see it embarrassed, believe me, the challah is not sitting there turning beet red. The challah is an inanimate object. But I'm training myself in sensitivity. If I'm sensitive to the embarrassment of an inanimate object that doesn't feel its embarrassment, I will train myself in being sensitive to human beings who are very acutely sensitive to their embarrassment. And what the Torah is, is a system of self-perfection and understanding that I, the human being, am extraordinarily sensitive. I change dramatically based on what I do. Because that's the reality of the human being, Hashem gave us many mitzvahs, the Torah is replete with many, many activities. And again, that's why we cover the challah, because again, it's training myself, training myself to feel a sensitivity to something that doesn't even feel embarrassment. Surely I'm going to be more sensitive to my wife, my children, people around me, because they really do feel embarrassment. And with that as an introduction, I'd like to ask the following question. The Cholos of explains to us that the central driving force for all of our Avod Hashem, what should motivate us, what should push us more than anything, is an overwhelming sense of, wow, Hashem, how could I ever pay you back one ten thousand, ten thousand for everything that you do for me? And he says that that should be the single center force, the single motivation, and we should need nothing else. But as we pointed out before in this series, for some reason it doesn't work. Meaning if you ask the average person, when you wake up in the morning, you have a sense of, wow, Hashem, you've done so much for me. I owe you so much. Hashem, what could I ever do to repay you? Sad to say, we don't feel that. And the question is, why not? And why is it that we're not naturally grateful? And I'd like to share with you that it's not true. We are 100% grateful. Every human being is very grateful. It's instinctive to the human to be grateful. We're extraordinarily grateful. And I'll show you an interesting example. Robert Silandandi wrote a book called Influence. And it's a very interesting book. A lot of sales organizations recommend it because he has underscored some of the principles, the operating principles of a human being. And one principle that he brings out is that every human being instinctively has a sense of gratitude. And if you do a favor to that human being, they almost have to pay you back. In fact, he brings documented studies that show that in every culture, in every society, gratitude permeates the society. It's basic. It's endemic to the human. And he shows an example after example. And I'd like to share with you one that I find very, very telling. Hare Krishna was a group of um, cultists who took to the streets of New York in the 70s. Now, if you've ever seen pictures of them, they wear these long robes, shaved heads, they walk around with these drums, and they sort of dance around the street. They're like Nach Nachmans, but a lot more on the fringe. And needless to say, they became a eyesore almost instantly. They sure didn't fit the American culture. They sure didn't fit what was going on. And to see these people walking either barefoot or with sandals, long flowing robes, head shaved, beating drums and dancing was a tremendous anomaly in the streets of New York. The sad part was that they were trying to raise money. They would dance around, play their drums, and hold out their hand to collect funds. And needless to say, they were not raising much money at all. As a matter of fact, it was a dismal failure because no one would support these weird people. 
until they change tactics. They change tactics by beginning to give out things. Before asking anyone for a donation, they would first give out some of their literature or some of their books. And later on, they switched even more. They would give out flowers. And this became the trademark of the Hare Krishnas. They would stand there, give out flowers. And they became one of the most phenomenally wealthy religious organizations in this country. They built campuses, 320 separate church buildings. They became so phenomenally wealthy because their tactic worked. And you could see films of it. And you could see a businessman rushing in the airport and a Hare Krishna person all that is robed that hold out a flower here, it's for you. And you could see the businessman doesn't want to take it, but he sort of can't, oh, please take it. No, I don't want it, take it. And you could almost w- watch the transition. The, the businessman's face would be, all right, he would take it. After taking the flower, the fellow would ask him for a small donation. And invariably, the businessman would reach into his pocket, pull out a dollar or two, and go about his business. And it became such a part of them that they would stand on street corners, they'd stand in airports, and they raised millions upon millions of dollars. But here's the interesting point. Why did it work? Because the businessman, the passerby, received something. They received something, and as soon as they received something, they felt obligated. They didn't want the object. They didn't want the flower. Had they not gotten the flower, they never would have given a penny because for years, Harry Krishnas could not raise a penny. But the minute the person got something, there was almost an obligation to give back, even though they didn't want what they received. How do we know that they didn't want it? Because Zilandani used to watch them in the airports. And he used to stand there, and he one time noticed that a young woman would bring back flowers, many flowers, and every few hours she would come back and bring back flowers, but they didn't look quite as fresh. And he followed her. And he found that she would go to the next nearest wastebasket where person after person would throw that out the flower. Meaning the Hare Krishna fellow would approach him and offer him a flower. They'd re- run things, sort of accept the flower and, and give it a dollar. And they'd throw it into the nearest wastebasket basket. And this reality that when I receive something, I feel an obligation to give back is basic to the human being in every society, in every environment. We human beings are instinctively grateful. So the question again begs being asked, why then don't I feel this overwhelming sense of gratitude to my creator? Why don't I feel this overwhelming sense of how could I ever pay back one ten thousandth of what Hashem has done for me? And the answer is very simple. We are incredibly grateful, but there's not much that I have. What, what, what did Hashem ever do for me? If Hashem would ever do anything, of course I'd pay back Hashem immediately. I'd want it, but what do I have? What does Hashem give me? There's nothing in my life. There's nothing that I owe Him. There's nothing that I owe Him because I have nothing. And if you think that this is strange, and if you think that this isn't accurate, just watch a teenager, a fine teenager, brought up in a fine home. And watch this teenager, and when one of his or her friends give him a present. Imagine for a minute you have a son, a 15, a 16-year-old son, and one of his friends buys him a brand new pair of uh, headsets, and Dr. Dre, a very fancy pair of headsets, and gives it to him as a birthday present. Wow! That's a st- I can't believe it. He gave me a pre- Wow, that's so great. I- and you could see his face light up. You could see the joy. You can see the enjoyment. And he'll act to that friend forever, grateful for what he's received. Ask that same teenager, uh, fellow, let me ask you a question. Have your parents ever given you anything? Nah. Do you owe your parents anything? Not really. Uh, uh, son, whose bed do you sleep in? Whose house do you live in? Whose food do you eat? Who pays your tuition? Who bought your clothing? That's their job. My parents, you know, they got to do that. That's, uh, that's what parents have to do. And the reality is that we human beings are incredibly grateful if we were given anything, but we're not appreciative. That teenager doesn't feel a sense of gratitude because whatever he has is what he has. I wasn't given that. That's not something I I, I would owe for because it's nothing. It's part of the woodwork, part of the scenery. If someone gives me something, then I feel a tremendous sense of gratitude. What's lacking isn't gratitude. What's lacking is appreciation. 
And it's a very strange thing because we human beings could have such tremendous wealth and such tremendous gifts right in front of our eyes. But if we don't train ourselves to appreciate it, no kidding, we're not grateful. But not because we're not grateful, because I don't have anything. And as strange as it sounds, you could have everything and not appreciate it. And I believe that one of the things that a human being needs to be successful in life is to train themselves in a very basic format of appreciating that which I have. And some of those things that I have to appreciate and really focus on should be pretty obvious. The fact that I have hands, the fact that I have eyes, and the fact that I have ears. If you'd like to see the beauty of what it means to see, just read a little bit of the writings of Helen Keller. She was a girl who was blind and deaf and astonishingly learned to read, learned to write. She became prolific. She wrote quite a number of books. And a number of the things she writes about is what it would be like if she could see for a day. And she describes the joy that she would have if she could just look at things. And in one of her essays, she writes about the fact that she asked one of her friends, she was a really grown woman at the time, where she had been. And her friend said, well, she went for a walk in the woods. And Helen Keller said to her, wow, that must have been amazing. What did you see? And her friend said, well, not much. And then Helen Keller goes on to say, could you imagine that? I, without sight, feel the bark of the tree. And I feel the leaves and I'm astonished by the velvety textures, the roughness. I revel in the differences of feeling. Could you imagine if I could see for a day what I would experience, how much enjoyment I would take from it? And the reality is that unless you're blind, you don't appreciate sight, unless you're deaf, heaven forfend, you don't appreciate hearing. But that's a given, but that doesn't mean it has to stay that way. The job of a human being is to grow. The job of a human being is to change. The job of a human being is to become more sophisticated, to work on myself so that I learn to appreciate my sight, my hearing, my sense of touch, to appreciate the beauty of this world. And I know that it works because the Torah gives us exact systems. And I know that the human being is extremely sensitive, but the problem is you have to be thinking about these things and you have to be focusing on them. And much like the Sefer Kinnuch says, if all day long you're going to be dealing with things that are going to corrupt you, you're going to be corrupted. If all day long everything I have is just there and I don't think about it, I don't appreciate it, it's not going to mean anything. And the only way I'm going to feel anything is if I think about it, work on it, and on a constant, ongoing basis, focus on my wealth, focus on the things that I have, and I learn to actually appreciate Once I appreciate them, naturally the gratitude will overwhelm me. Obviously, I'll enjoy life to a much greater extent. Certainly, I'll feel a sense of wanting to pay back my creator, and I'll live a very different life. Now, that being said, I'd like to share with you what I consider to be an interesting observation. In 1861, this country went to war, and it was a horrible war. We're talking about casualties that are astonishing. 2.5% of the population died in that war. In today's terms, it would be the equivalent of 9 million soldiers. We're talking one out of five soldiers at the time died in that war. Now, what enemy was it against? Was it uh, England attacking back for the colonies? Was it France? Was it uh, Russia? Uh, No, it wasn't because it was a civil war. There was state against state, family against family, sometimes within the same family, fighting on different sides of the battle lines. And what we as a country got to experience was one of the most horrific, destructive wars ever certainly brought to this country. Now, you have to ask yourself the following question. What would motivate an 18-year-old and a 20-year-old to go to war? Now, initially, I guess, There's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of fanfare, you know, you wear the colors and you march out with the drums and all that good stuff. But what about a fellow who's seen the battle? And what about an 18-year-old who sees victim after victim coming back with casualties that are indescribable? And keep in mind, there were no prosthetics back in the Civil War era. 
And if you lost your leg in a battle, that meant for the rest of your life you were hobbling around on one leg. Maybe you got a wooden leg. But imagine you're an 18-year-old or a 20-year-old and you get to see casualty after casualty, people dying. And we're talking four years of war. What motivated them? And while it's true that initially there might have been some excitement, some glory to it, at the end of the day, there was honor, loyalty, country, sense of duty, I can't be a coward, whatever it might be, but here's the point. I believe that every person in that war at some point had to ask themselves the following question. What in the world am I doing here? This is crazy. What are we fighting for? First of all, do I believe in slavery that strongly one way or the other? I don't know, but one thing for sure, it's not worth my dying for. It's not worth my giving up my life. I don't have the kind of convictions that I'm willing to give up my life for. So what made it happen? And the answer is that while every person at some point asked themselves that question, they went back to the stupor and back to the drills, back to whatever kept them, and they kept doing something till their death or till they came back injured or till they came back alive that was clearly something that they thought about with objective clarity. Had they really been in their right mind, they would have run away from. And that's an important point. Why? Because while it might be the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, we human beings get into this mode of doing and doing and running and running. And if we ever think for a moment, it's quickly forgotten and we go back to the routine, whether it's good for us or not. And I believe that at some point in your life, you have to make a decision. You have to make a decision. Am I going to be that robotic person? Am I going to be that automaton? Am I going to be that horse that runs wildly into battle without thinking, without discussing, without debating whether it's good for me or bad for me? Everyone's doing it, so I'll do it. It's the thing that's done, so I'll be like them and, and just continue. And at some point, you have to ask yourself that question. And you have to ask yourself, why am I doing it? And that question, I believe, is profound. And I'll share with you here in one particular area why it's so profound. In the course of history, never has there been a wealthier generation. In the course of history, never have we had such abundance, opulence, and luxuries. And also, in the course of history, never has there been such a needy generation. Never has there been such want. Never has there been such hunger for things. And we discussed before some of the whys. Some of it has to do with advertising. Some of it has to do with the fact that we human beings by nature, whatever we get becomes the kind of the lay of the land that becomes the background. So we need more and more and more. But I believe there's a particular reason when it comes to material possessions, why it's even more difficult to actually stop the treadmill and actually pay attention to what I have and recognize that I have tremendous wealth at my fingertips. And what is that reason? You see, a toy has a very specific function. If you give a child a toy, and the child plays with that toy, and the toy serves its function very well, it's for the child's amusement, it's for the child's entertainment, and whether it be a truck, whether it be a car, whether it be whatever it might be, and when the child plays with it properly, appropriately, the child enjoys tremendous pleasure from it, and the toy serves its function very well. But when the child uses the toy for a different function, it no longer functions very well at all. When the child uses the toy to show his friend what he has and his friend doesn't have, when the child uses the toy to demonstrate his superiority, the toy no longer functions well. Because then the toy isn't being used as a source of entertainment. The toy is being used in that competition between people. And in that competition, it's but one rung in the status, one additional jewel in my crown. And used in that way, it offers the child very little satisfaction. You see, when the child says, see, I got it and you don't, okay, there's some negative enjoyment but the child's not enjoying the toy. 
and the toy is no longer serving for the child's enjoyment, and the child no longer has fun with the toy. And oh, the child is very engaged in that competition. Yes, the child is very, very much focused on the fight between he and his brother, but the toy no longer brings him joy, no longer is a source of enjoyment, because the toy is being used for a function that it wasn't created for. You ever read the bumper sticker, He who dies with the most toys wins? That is indicative of our environment, our society, the world we live in. We judge people by the way they dress, judge them by the cars they drive, we judge them by the houses they live in, and you'll say, well, it's only natural, but that's exactly the point. The Chovas of others explained, you could have everything, tremendous wealth, you won't enjoy it whatsoever. Why? Because you're so focused on what you don't have, you can't even see what you do have. He explains one of the reasons why we so much don't feel that we owe Hashem anything is because we don't have anything. Why don't I have anything? Look what I have. I don't have anything because I'm so focused on what I don't have that I can't even appreciate what I do have. Oh, if I had that house, then I'd be wealthy. If I had that car, then I'd be doing well. And whether we like to admit to it or not, we are extraordinarily focused on the next level, the next level, and what this one has, what that one has. And we're so focused on that that we can't even appreciate what we do have. And if you're not sure that I'm right, just watch what happens when someone from within your own social circle, not someone above you, but someone within your own social circle suddenly gets something new, something better. Maybe again, a new dress, a new house, a new toy, whatever it might be, all of a sudden it tears your eyes out. Listen, I don't got to be the best, but I can't be below. I can't have it be that everyone's house is at this par and mine isn't. I can't make that kind of bar mitzvah if everyone is making a nicer bar mitzvah. Now, while it may sound like it doesn't apply to you and me, it applies 100%. And all you have to do is study other people and watch how much it bothers them. Watch how much it tears out their eyes and how much money they spend on things that they don't need and how little enjoyment they get from it. And then say to yourself, I get it. We human beings are very competitive. We human beings are status focused. And I, too, am a human being. And when you realize that, what you realize is that unless you make a conscious effort to train yourself, to actually appreciate what you have, you're destined to be poor. Now, let's not make a mistake. The objective of the Torah, and certainly the objective of this series, is not to be wealthy. It's a nice thing to enjoy. It's a nice thing. The objective is to be a thinking, growing person. And at the end of the day, Hashem gave us tremendous wealth. And I think one of the easiest places to see it is the extraordinary material wealth that we enjoy in our generation. And that's the first place to start. Why? Because it's so abundant. We have such prosperity and we don't experience it. We don't enjoy it. And I think that's the easiest place to start. It's not the end game because it's supposed to expand to everything, to my sight, to my hearing, to my the fact that I exist, the fact that I have mobility, the fact that I can walk, the fact that I breathe. But the first point to start at in our wealthy world is the extraordinary wealth that we have. And again, the greatest indication of how much work we have to do is when you ask yourself, am I rich? What are my pleasures? What are, what are my tremendous luxuries? And every one of us says the same, what are luxuries? Come on, I just, I'm barely making it. I'm barely eking by. Come on, luxuries? And again, I think the work is to begin focusing on this and to begin appreciating it. And to do this, I'd like to share with you a basic Musser observation and then some exercises that I think will be very helpful. And let's begin with the following. What the Chovas of Ovas is teaching us is that by nature we compare. We compare ourselves to others. We compare ourselves to what he has, what she has, and that's how we judge, and that's how we rate how we're doing. But you have to understand that this is very, very natural to the human. Not just in terms of my status, not just in terms of what I have, but in general, the way we know whether something is heavy is by comparing it to something else. The way we know if something is right is by comparing it to something dark. Contrast 
is the way that we measure things. And the way we know something has a particular property is by comparing it to something else. And we human beings, while we think we're so objective, are largely influenced by things that are a little more subtle than we realize. Let me share with you an interesting example. There's something that's known in the labs of various university, what they call a psychophysics experiment. What a professor will do is he'll bring in three buckets of water. One bucket very hot, one bucket is very cold, and the middle bucket has lukewarm water. And he'll ask one of the students to come up, and the student will sit down on the chair, and the professor will say, okay, I want you to put one hand, your left hand, in the very hot water, the other hand in the very cold water, and I want you to hold it there for one minute. And while the entire class watches, the student puts a hand in both, and the professor starts the timer. 60 seconds later, the professor says, okay, fine, take both hands out, put them both into the tepid, into the lukewarm water, and the student does that, and the reaction is priceless. What? Huh? Huh? You see, the hand that was in the very cold water feels the lukewarm water as hot. And the hand that was in the hot water now feels the lukewarm water as cold. But it's clearly the same water, clearly the same temperature. But the hand that was coming from hot feels that it's very cold. The hand that was coming from very cold feels that it's hot. And this is a very clear example of this contrast principle by comparing, by contrasting. That's how we draw our conclusions. And this is something that's used all the time. If you've ever been taken around by a real estate agent, you know that the last house that the realtor shows you is going to be the nicest one because she wants you to compare it to the other ones and you'll see the first house ah, kind of dumpy the second house not such a good neighborhood third house ah, the last house is gorgeous objectively it may not be that nice but because you were taken on this tour and this is by far the nicest you see its beauty and this is a very effective sales tactic and maybe Shatranim should use it as well. But that's a reality that we compare, we contrast, and that's how we rate, and that's how we know how things stand. And I believe that that opens us up to a tremendous amount of natural Musar exercises. Let me share with you one. Would you like to know whether you're wealthy? Go to Uman. Go to Uman today and look around. Ask people who go there on Rosh Hashanah what is life like there for the peasants without running water, without toilets, without anything there? Ask them what life is like. My daughter went on a Holocaust, just as part of seminary, they all go to the, to the various parts of the Ukraine, etc. And she explained to me, it was a pretty large seminary class, so there were a number of buses, and behind the buses was a truck with the porta johnnies, the portable bathrooms. Because a part of the Ukraine they were going, people lived in, but there were no bathrooms that you could use. There were outhouses. There were no public restrooms. You didn't have McDonald's that you could use the facilities at. They had to drag along these porta johnnies because parts of the world today are still so, what we would call primitive, that they don't enjoy running water. They don't enjoy bathrooms. Think about that and then compare it to us, to our world to the luxuries that we enjoy. Study a small part of history. Look at life in the 1930s. Read about it. Read about what it was like in the Great Depression. Read about men standing on street corners selling apples, maybe, maybe, to make a few pennies. Look at pictures of Rockefeller giving out dimes and people lining up around the block to receive a dime. And when you compare yourself to then, suddenly you could experience your wealth. But you have to do the exercise. You have to actually do it and then compare it. See yourself there and bring yourself back here and say, wow, look at the wealth that I have. Do you wear glasses? Glasses are a tremendous bracha. If you're nearsighted and you can't see, or if you're farsighted and you can't see close, glasses are a tremendous thing. Well, just understand that 300 years ago, no one wore glasses. And if you were nearsighted or you were farsighted, that was it. The scope of your vision was 18 inches. Or you could not read very close. But that was it. You were destined to be there. Yet now we have glasses. 
different types of glasses, depending on the focus, and we all have them. And if you want to really grow in appreciation, here's a simple Musser exercise. If you wear glasses, take them off. Take them off and walk around your house for 10 minutes. Now, if you're like me, you're going to bump into some things. But that process of trying to make your way around, trying to find a can of beans in the cabinet will be very, very illustrative. Because after 10 minutes of walking around and realizing that sight is a tremendous gift, when you put your glasses back on, wow, sharpness, clarity. I can see such textures, dimensions. But you see, you have to do the exercise. And you have to do the exercise regularly. And it has to be part of your day. It has to be something you do regularly. You know, I say this all the time, and maybe I'm be guilty of repeating. I spend 30 minutes a day in therapy. I spend 30 minutes a day because my Rebbe taught me that you have to learn Musr every day. And I learn Musr every day for at least 30 minutes. And I sit there and I work on things, whether it be sometimes appreciation, sometimes different character traits. But the point is that it's a process. It's a process, and if you do the exercises, then you come out with a different sense, a different feeling. But you can't just think about it. You can't just say, oh, yeah, that's something I, I bet you it would work. You have to actually do it. And if you actually do the steps and actually do it, you find yourself feeling differently. Here's another simple one. Take your shoes off. Take your shoes off and walk around the house. Very nice. What's the problem? Take your shoes off and walk around the house. And when you bump your toes a little bit, then try the muscle exercise. Walk outside in your stocking feet. Walk outside as the pebbles and the rocks bruise your on, on the part of your foot. Walk outside as you feel the rough exterior. And walk outside and realize, I have something called shoes. And they're incredibly comfortable. And they protect my feet. And they make it easy to walk. They offer me support. But I don't just have one pair of shoes. I have brown and black and different ones for a wedding, different ones for Shabbos. I have different ones for running. And when you do that exercise of actually taking your shoes off and walking outside with your bare feet or with your stocking feet and you feel the roughness and you see what it's like, then when you put your shoes back on, you actually appreciate it. But you see, if you don't do this, it doesn't work. It's such a simple muscle exercise, but you actually have to do it. And if you do it, then you recognize the wealth, the extraordinary wealth. Do you know that I am so wealthy that I have different clothing for when I sleep? I have a different set of clothing that I sleep in and then I go about my day in. But not just that. I have a whole different set of clothing for Shabbos than I do for the weekdays. And not just that. If I exercise, a different set of clothing for that. And I have a different set of shoes, of course. But you understand the luxuries? Do you understand the wealth? Well, you won't understand it until you actually go through the process of envisioning, imagining what it's like living without it. Imagine what it's like living without running, without running water. How can you live without running water? Imagine what it's like living without running water. A hundred years ago in Europe, my grandparents, maybe your great-grandparents, all lived in homes without running water. They went to the center of town where there was a well, and they cranked it and pulled up whatever the buckets and brought it back to the shtetl little home. But that's how people lived. But you're not going to feel your wealth until you see yourself there, until you read about it, until you experience it, and really feel what it's like to live without running water, without toilets in your house, without tremendous wealth. We have extraordinary, extraordinary wealth. But if you don't do the necessary steps of learning to appreciate it, it might as well not be there, and it won't be there because it's like it's not there. You see, if you don't train yourself, and it's all just part of the woodwork, part of whatever, there's nothing to be appreciative for because I have nothing. And you live an austere, difficult life without any pleasures, without any enjoyments. Because why? Because there is nothing. I'm a poor man. I'm living just in a very black and white, ugly, difficult life. And when you train yourself to actually appreciate it, you see that that's not life at all. 
And again, the goal here is not to end in a sense of I have tremendous material wealth, although that's a good first step. The end goal is to be a sophisticated human being, to appreciate that which Hashem made for me to enjoy, to use it for that purpose, and to have a sense of, wow, look what I have. Would you like to have a very spiritual experience? Go to an old age home. Watch a 90-year-old man walk with a walker. Watch him as he hobbles, as each step sort of difficult and very, very hard. And if you really want to grow, use the walker. You'll tell me it's an Ein Hura, I'll tell you, don't worry about it. Put yourself in that walker and try. Envision what it's like to actually be in that state. And what it's like after each step, each movement, each is a... A huge, huge burden. But if you actually do that exercise, or if you take a cane and you actually imagine what it's like when you walk around barely able to support yourself, if you do that for 10 minutes, you come back to a different sense of your mobility, of your legs. But you have to do it, and you have to do it regularly, time after time after time. You see, life brings us tremendous opportunities all the time. If you go to an old age home or you see an older person or you see something, you could either say, Nebuch, that's too bad, which you should say. You should feel their pain, obviously. But there's another huge lesson to learn. Baruch Hashem, that I have mobility. And when I see a blind person, I'm supposed to feel for them. I'm supposed to be sensitive to them. And I'm also supposed to say the words, wow, look what Hashem has given me. Look at this gift of sight. And what you're supposed to do as you go through life is grow in appreciation, grow in the sense of what I take as a given didn't have to be there. Hashem didn't have to make the world this way. And my life doesn't have to be unfolding as it is. And I focus on the tremendous amount of good and pleasures and things that Hashem made strictly for me to enjoy. And when you do that, you lead a very different life. Just walk outside on a February day. Walk outside in your shirt sleeves, and as you're shivering, as you're shivering to the bone, say to yourself, I get it. It's very cold. It's very cold out here. And then say to yourself, wait a minute. A hundred years ago, how did people live? Oh, I get it. In a fireplace. That fireplace that heated up a little area in front of it with holes in the walls. That's how regular people live. But you have to experience it. You have to envision it. You have to stand outside and really, really be there. And by the way, would you like to know one of the greatest cures for depression? I have a muscle exercise that I believe will cure almost every case of depression, unless it's really, really severe. Here we go. Go to the side of a pool. Take a very deep breath, maybe a few breaths. Jump into that pool, hold your breath underwater as long as you can. And if you're really good at this, and you get past a minute, and you get to a minute and a half, and you get to two minutes, at a certain point, there's going to be a burning in your lungs, a sort of a need to explode. And there's going to be just, and when you burst to the surface, you're going to hugely appreciate breathing, and usually, usually appreciate life. You see, there's nothing like a very close brush with death to allow a person to appreciate life. And there's nothing like a near-death experience to allow a person to really appreciate what life is all about. I guess it's in Baruch Hashem that we don't often have these kind of situations, but the reality is that when you read about people going through things, or you envision things happening, if you see yourself falling, or you see yourself being damaged, you begin to look back at your own life in a very different way. But again, it doesn't work unless you actually do the exercises. And I have one more that I think bears repeating. Every one of us, on a regular basis, go to the bathroom. That's part of, uh, part of being a human being. And we also make a bracha when we come out of that bathroom. Ashiyasa. Hashem, you created the human being with great wisdom. You made various tubes, various openings, various uh, things to close them. Uh, 
Baruch Atah Hashem, Rofei Kobasa, you heal all flesh, umafli lasos, and make wonderment. You, <clears throat> what you do is, is wondrous. Now it's a nice bracha. Did you ever think about that bracha? Did you ever read what it's like if you cannot go to the bathroom? Do you know what it's like to have to have a catheter put in? Do you know what it's like to be in a situation where going to the bathroom is one of the most difficult things in your world? What about someone who has a bag? What about someone who has an issue with their colon and they no longer can use the facilities as you and I do and they have a bag that's with them all the time and that's something they deal with and have to deal with the smell and the cleaning and, and, and whatever else. Ooh, Rabbi, don't make me think about that. Do think about it. Think about it and focus on it. Realize that Baruch Hashem, that's not me. Look at my health. My health, what do I mean? Come on. I'm getting older and cranky in my back. Yeah, look at your health. I still am able to use the facilities completely at ease. And I have tremendous, tremendous things that are working all the time. But you have to actually do the exercises. You have to go to the old age home. You have to read about various diseases. And you have to see what it's like for people who suffer. And you have to feel their pain. At the same time that you feel the pain, you have to say to yourself, Wow, look what Hashem has given me. And when you do this, and you do it often enough, what happens is you have a different sense. You have a different sense of your wealth and your ashiras. You have a different sense of appreciation. And you begin to understand a little bit in what we owe to Hashem. If you go through those brachas in the morning, we touched on this in one of the sessions, as the Mishabrura explains, the berchas hanenin. And the berchas hanenin is a bracha you make when you enjoy something. Before you eat an apple, before you eat a pear, before you eat a banana, you have to make a bracha to thank Hashem for what you're about to receive. We make a whole string of brachas in the morning. And those brachas are supposed to be said with a tremendous outpouring. My Rebbe, the Roshiva, that's all I used to say, that's a Musar Seder. That should be an emotional experience. And just think about it. Baruch at Hashem, blessed be you God, Zokif Kifufim, you right in the crooked. It was a number of years ago. I took my kids were little. I took them skiing. And then my Shana was then, I think she was four or five. She was a very brave kid. And we were on the ski lift together. The other kids were behind us. I was with her. And all of a sudden, we're pretty high up. She jumps off. Jumps off. And the kid's going down the mountain. She's five years. I'm like, I also jumped off. And as I jumped, oh, I felt my back. Oh, I cannot describe the pain. I barely climbed out of bed the next morning. Barely made it to the hot bath. And for two weeks... I couldn't walk. Baruch at Hashem zokif kefufim. If I remember that pain and remember what it's like and watch an elderly person hunched over and realize that it's a tremendous bracha. no sein la yayiv koach. Hashem, you give strength to the tired. Have you ever known someone with chronic fatigue syndrome? Someone who's constantly, constantly tired and fatigued and nothing, they can't do anything. You can't eat, you can't sleep, you can't, ugh, it just, ugh. Life stinks, and it's true that they're suffering. But Baruch Hashem, I put my head on the pillow, and I close my eyes, I open them hours later, and I'm refreshed, invigorated. And I have to appreciate that. It's a tremendous bracha. Matira surim. Hashem, you free the imprisoned. And the Mishburu explains there are two separate kavanas. Two separate intentions in that bracha. One literally, Hashem, you free those who are in prison. Literally, you free. But there's another intention there. And that intention is that I have mobility. Have you ever seen someone who, Rahman al had a stroke? Have you ever seen them confined to a wheelchair? But not just a wheelchair, confined to the body. Because they can't control their arms or their legs. And, and they're drooling. And they, they just can't control their muscles anymore. And they're locked in to their own body. But it's a person just like you and me, and even young people. And go, you go to the units and they deal with these issues. You go to NYU, you go into the various clinics, and you'll see people just like you and me, Rahman al they have a stroke. Suddenly, it's a very different life. But you have to envision that it's you. You have to see yourself in that chair. You have to envision what it's like that you can't lift a spoon. You cannot lift it. And if and after weeks and weeks, months and months of therapy, somehow you get some muscular control, 
<laughs> it's still it's spastic and you have no real fine motor control and for years if you recuperate for years you'll have trouble feeding yourself these are things that I don't think about and because I don't think about it I don't think about my flexibility my control my coordination Pokeh Ivrim Hashem you give sight to the blinded but the point is that all of these things not tremendous life-changing concepts if you use them. You could go through that string of brachas in the morning and never even understand what you're saying, never even get the point of the most exercise. But if you stop the busyness, if at some point you say, I get it, I'm not satisfied just existing, I'm not satisfied just going through the motions, I'm going to live a life with purpose, with plan, and you begin using the Torah, the system, as Hashem intends it, you live a very different life. I think what the tour is sharing with us is a tremendous concept. We cover the challah. Why? Not because the challah is embarrassed. We cover the challah to train ourselves in sensitivity. If to the inanimate object I'm sensitive for its embarrassment, surely to human being, why do we do that? Because I am sensitive. I'm sensitive to change. I'm sensitive to what I do, to what I think, to what I'm involved in. As the Sefer Chinuch explains, and I could be the most ethical, honest person in the world. If the king gives me a job to be a corrupt individual, and I lie and I steal and I cheat, that will become me. Why are we given so many mitzvahs? Because as the Sefer Chinuch explains, Adam Nifala Pi we are affected greatly by what we do. When you do something again and again, it changes your mood. It changes the way you feel. It changes the way you think, and it changes you. And the point is that if we want to lead a life as Hashem intends it, you have to do a lot of work. Because there's a tremendous amount that you're going to receive all day long in the opposite. As advertising wants to make you hungry and needy and needy, so too that voice in your head that says, come on, what do I have? I have so little, what do I have? And besides, look what he has, look what she has. Look at that house, look at that car, look at that. And even though you don't want to, and even though you're not competitive, and even though you're not materialistic, it's nature, that's the way human human beings are. Gratitude is instinctive to the human. Appreciation isn't. Gratitude is that need to give back. The Hare Krishnas proved that because the minute that businessman got a flower, he had to give something back. That's a reciprocation. You just need to give back. But that's because he received something. Our problem isn't gratitude. Our problem is like that teenager who, my parents didn't give me anything. He's a very grateful child. The minute his friend gives him that headset, oh, wow, that's so wonderful, because he finally received something. The problem isn't his sense of gratitude. The problem is his sense of appreciation, understanding that what I have didn't have to be given to me. What I have isn't just to be taken for granted. But to actually feel that, not just say it, requires work. And then the work is very, very actual. You have to be there. You have to jump into the pool and really try to hold your breath for two minutes. And you have to really go outside barefoot. You really have to go through the exercises and then you have to use them time after time after time. But if you do it repeatedly on a regular basis, you'll find tremendous wealth, tremendous gifts. You'll find yourself experiencing wealth and enjoyments and pleasure beyond description. And you'll begin to become a thinking, growing person. And I don't know if I could do this concept justice, but I'd like to close with one last observation. What would life be like if I actually trained myself and I actually appreciated what I have? What would my life be like? I open my eyes in the morning and say, wow, and look at the astonishing beauty, colors, textures. Aromas, wow, and eggs, frying egg, wow. And I smell it all the way up here, it's incredible. And as I get out of bed, oh my goodness, mobility. I can move with such ease, it's, such, it's incredible, wow. And I feel my thing, wow, hard and coarse and soft. And I, this is incredible. And I go to the bed, oh my goodness, flawlessly, without any trouble, without any problems. And I walk out and I go through, my life would be so astonishingly different. I would be high all day. And the point isn't to enjoy pleasures of this world. The point is to lead a life with meaning, with intention, 
and to recognize the tremendous bracha that we have, to recognize the tremendous gifts that Hashem gave to me, to recognize more than anything that Hashem is the mative, Hashem is the giver. And while Hashem created me for a great purpose not to do with this world, Hashem created me for the world to come, and that Hashem put so many pleasures into this world for one reason, so that I should enjoy. And to use those tools, to use those tools for their stated purpose, that person who focuses that way enjoys life tremendously, gains their world to come, leads a vastly different life.